The Second World War saw the development of some iconic German tanks, known for their advanced technology and formidable reputation on the battlefield. Tanks like the Tiger I and Panther were marvels of engineering, boasting thick armor, powerful guns, and advanced suspension systems. These innovations allowed them to outmatch many of their opponents. But, did these advancements come at a cost? It is widely assumed that German tanks during the Second World War, particularly late models, were over-engineered and over-complicated. In this video, we'll examine both sides of this argument. It's the story of amazing engineering and superb products, created within a structure of authoritarian politics and management. It's a story about how engineering and design are political, and how they can't thrive in a society rife with privilege, power, and fear. Beginning in the 1930s, this story unfolds as Germany, post-World War I, faced restrictions against possessing an army with tanks. Also, the nation had forfeited manufacturing capabilities and expertise, having relinquished entire factories and territory to France. Thus, Hitler's aspiration to reconstruct an army, mandated covert actions, and a return to fundamentals. With the assistance of Soviet Russia, Germany secured a foundation within Russian borders, to initiate the rebuilding process. The Panzer II was one of the earliest tanks built to test, both tank construction and tank operation. Functioning as a minimum viable prototype, it was never intended for practical deployment in real combat scenarios. Yet, it was ultimately employed in both the Spanish Civil War, and the first few years of World War II. This was owing to political and military necessity, as well as the realization that not enough real tanks would be available in time. The Panzer III and IV were Germany's intended main tanks at the start of World War II. They had comparable designs, but varied in size and weapons. The differences stemmed from tank utilization concepts, formulated in theoretical terms during the early 1930s, and put to the test in battles in the latter part of the decade. Panzer IVs were made by Krupp, while Daimler-Benz produced the Panzer III. The Panzer IV, a robust design, was produced continuously throughout the war, with its chassis adapted for various tank configurations. When Germany invaded the Soviet Union in 1941, the army quickly realized that their Panzer III and IV tanks were totally outclassed by Russian T-34 and KV-1 tanks. The impact was shocking, prompting an accelerated pace in the Tiger I project and the commencement of the Panther project. The Tiger I stands out as perhaps the most renowned German tank from World War II. However, it serves as an early example of how fixation on size and remarkable engineering contributed to a general letdown. For years, the concept of a strongly armored, breakthrough tank had floated, but lighter, faster medium tanks made more sense. Building large things tends to be a fascination in authoritarian regimes, and the Tiger arose from this behavior. The Tiger tank was developed in a competition between Porsche and Henschel engineers. This rivalry was fueled by the aim to win Hitler's approval, during demonstrations he attended, occasionally timed to coincide with his birthday. German technological advancements during World War II were entirely centered on seeking favor and impressing the Fuhrer. However, this approach gave rise to major issues. The Tiger was an impressive and powerful tank, yet it suffered from unreliability and excessive production costs. A British-captured early version was meticulously dissected, impressing army engineers with its craftsmanship. 
However, they accurately assessed that it was extremely expensive, and would consume precious factory resources and time. This proved detrimental to numerous German projects. The fit and finish aspect of German tanks is also noteworthy. They had very high quality armor plate, refined welding, and an abundance of additional components. For instance, manufacturers could have streamlined production by eliminating numerous vision ports and unnecessary flaps on early models. Changes like transitioning from leather seats to canvas should have been implemented at the war's outset. They could have preserved quality where essential, while promptly discarding frills and non-essential features. Products crafted to please a select group of politicians consumed diminishing resources of materials and money. The Panther is often hailed as an early version of a modern main battle tank, achieving a balance between mobility, firepower, and armor. It incorporated the concept of sloped armor from Russian tank design, and employed suspension and engine advancements from the Tiger I project, culminating in an exceptional medium tank. It was hurried into production, with initial versions sent into combat, which proved to be a mistake. The Russians gained insights into the tank's vulnerabilities, before its development was complete. Subsequently, the tank underwent rapid reconstruction and enhancements, ultimately becoming a remarkably effective vehicle. The Panther, weighing 45 tons, was only marginally more costly than the 25-ton Panzer IV. The prices, excluding the radio or gun, were actually 120,000 and 110,000 Reichsmarks respectively. This price difference can be attributed to the implementation of advanced production methods in the relatively streamlined Panther design. Another aspect worth highlighting is the mechanical reliability of the heavier German tanks. It's well known that German tanks gained a reputation for being notably unreliable and demanding in terms of maintenance. However, in the instance of Tiger and Panther tanks, this was largely a consequence of their hasty deployment without adequate problem-solving time. As the war progressed, the issues with these tanks were addressed, rendering them notably reliable machines. Yet, their relatively intricate nature meant that maintenance and repairs often took more time compared to the simpler Allied tanks. A significant portion of tank losses, if not the majority, resulted from the challenges posed by operational withdrawals, making recovery of even lightly damaged tanks improbable. During the later stages of the war, the Wehrmacht was often in retreat, intensifying the issue of vehicle breakdowns. The Panzer IV continued to serve as Germany's practical tank choice, meeting requirements and bridging gaps resulting from the sluggish production and availability issues of both Tiger I and Panther tanks. Its production continued throughout the war, due to its ability to fulfill needs effectively. Evidently, a handful of exceptionally designed tanks couldn't secure victory against the multitude of good enough tanks, on both eastern and western fronts. Authoritarian governments often make impractical products, as excessive deference to the leader, resulting in misguided pathways in development. Hitler took great pleasure in seeing all new products, and asserting his opinions on their course. Individuals crafted items with the aim of impressing him, or altered them to evade his disapproval. Evidently, a distinction existed between Germany and Russia. Although both were under authoritarian rule, Hitler frequently engaged in design decisions, a practice not as commonly observed with Stalin. In wartime, a tank's lifespan is determined by the enemy, impacting production quality as well. 
The Soviets placed immense emphasis on tank production due to substantial losses, necessitating a considerable output. Contrary to the perception of simpler design equating to greater reliability, Soviet tanks, including the T-34, were not markedly more reliable than the supposedly over-engineered Panther or Tiger tanks. In reality, the T-34 had its share of unreliability, exacerbated by the inadequate provision of spare parts to Soviet armored units, due to the focus on maximizing complete tank production. With the benefit of hindsight, it's evident that Germany's persistent quest for larger and superior tanks didn't yield favorable results. This leads to a widely held view that the alternative strategy, concentrating on producing numerous smaller and lighter tanks, would have been a more effective choice. However, Germany's limitation lay in its finite size as a nation, along with constrained resources and a population from which to recruit tank crews. Germany's industrial capacity was limited, and it was never able to compete with the Allies, especially the Americans and the Soviets. Due to these limitations, merely increasing the production of Panzer IVs and Stug III's might not have made a substantial difference. Germany couldn't have matched the Allies' extensive tank production numbers. Their optimal strategy was to create tanks of superior quality, exemplified by the Tiger I and Panther, as their best chance for success. For the most part, these tanks had the capability to confront multiple Allied tanks and emerge as the victor. While real combat didn't always guarantee such outcomes, there were many instances where these tanks proved their effectiveness. It's also worth noting that many German design decisions did go seriously overboard. Tanks like the Tiger II, AFVs like the Jagd Tiger, and additional features like Zimmerit, were extremely extravagant and needless. These instances showcase how certain German design choices turned counterproductive, resulting in substantial waste of time, money, and resources. Certainly, there were poorly conceived tanks within the Wehrmacht by 1944, and a lack of standardization was evident. However, the most flawed designs didn't undergo extensive production. The heavy tanks, despite their drawbacks, inflicted considerable damage, to some extent justifying their cost and resource consumption. The central issue with German wartime tank production, didn't primarily lie in over-engineering. Rather, the main challenge stemmed from production being dispersed across numerous companies, due to political factors. The influence of tycoons aligned with the Nazis, led to the preservation of their vested interests, even during a period of total war. The lack of production standardization and a focus on quantity, was further complicated by this fragmented production approach. The Wehrmacht won battles with inferior tanks, and later faced defeat with superior ones. The key takeaway is that battle results are influenced by factors beyond the equipment, fixated on by military enthusiasts. It's not a matter of sophistication versus simplicity, being universally disastrous, rather, battles hinge on a multitude of factors. In the end, the concept of prioritizing quality over quantity, holds merit for Germany. Recognizing their inability to match the Allies tank for tank, it was logical to focus on constructing tanks of superior quality. Although hindsight shows this strategy didn't yield success, it shouldn't be summarily dismissed. The outcome of building more affordable and lighter tanks remains uncertain. It's possible that it might have been a more effective approach, or maybe not. Ultimately, we are left without a definitive answer.